Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Westman, and this is the Keto Made Simple podcast. Hi, Dr. Eric Westman here, and it's my great pleasure to be able to talk to Dr. David Unwit, who's in the UK, and thanks for, for being here and talking to me, David. You're so welcome. I've been looking forward to this. We've got such a lot in common. Well, I, I have to say that uh, you've been very influential in the UK in the uh, collecting data audits from your practice and showing you can save money using this crazy thing called a low carb diet. <laughs> so uh, uh, before we get to all, all of that, how, how did you get started? So just kind of assume someone doesn't know who you are at all and um, how you got into. Okay. So so I'm an elderly GP. I'm 65. I'm, uh, I've looked at all oh, the 65, 65. I just sang the Beatles song when I'm 64 for my birthday. Well, there we go. So but you've done better in the hair department than me, Eric. I noticed straight away without a, sh without a shadow of any kind of jealousy. I noticed. <laughs> I've gone heavily. Again, I, and, I, I assume you're a starship captain from, from my I, birthday. I look like one. I know. It'd be good. So, yeah, I've looked after the same population for 40 years. And that brings with it a lot of insights and and good stuff, really. Uh, but when I was 55, uh, most of in the UK, most clinicians retire when they're 55. They are all oh, friends retired at 55. And I, I was thinking I should as well because I was really fed up with medicine. And I didn't feel I was making a difference. Uh, I don't know. I just thought maybe do something more interesting, something else. Anyway, uh, the story is a single patient changed my life. One patient, one day, changed my life. Um, we're paid in the UK for, in part, for medicating our patients, which I don't really agree with. So when a patient of mine stopped taking her metformin for her type 2 diabetes, um, I wrote to her uh, saying I had concerns about her diabetic control and please would she make an appointment to see me soon. And of course I was going to tell her off and, and say, oh dear, you're not taking your drugs, you're going to come to harm and so on and so forth. But I was in for a shock, a real shock, because she... First of all, she came in and I didn't recognize her. She looked so fabulous. She'd lost two to three stone in weight. And remind me, how, how much is a stone again? Stone is 14 pounds. 14. The multiplied were... by, can we do that together? Three fours are 12. So that's 42 pounds, isn't it? Oh, she'd lost yeah. two pounds. And as a, as a result, look. Different. And she dressed so differently. But I was in for a much bigger, a bigger surprise than her weight loss was how cross she was with me. And she said, you know, I know you're going to tell me off for not taking the met for me. Well, you, uh, you need to think again because I've done my blood sugar and it's normal. And I don't need your metformin anymore because I've gone on this low carb diet. And I know you don't, you won't approve, but I feel wonderful. My blood sugar's normal. My blood pressure's better. And I won't take your medication no matter what you say. And then she said, you know, you had me on metformin. You never once asked me about dietary sources of sugar, particularly starchy carbs. You didn't mention that once in 10 years. And, you know, do you not realize that bread is sugar and that potatoes are sugar and rice is sugar? Look, and, and then she your, said, your patient is telling you this. Yes. Yeah, you're the you're the general practitioner who, who's treated her for ages. Yeah, I treated her probably for twenty years at least, and she was hopping mad. And she explained that she'd never told me, but the metformin had gave, given her diarrhea, and she'd found that so embarrassing she'd never told me. And she said, well, "So I didn't you know how to communicate with your patients? <laughs> of course, you know how to." But I do, I do. Anyway, what I, I tell you what I do know, and that is an angry woman, you need to start listening. And so... I learned that a long time ago. Uh, woman, you should shut up and listen. And, and she's, the most provocative thing she said was, Dr. Roman, I wondered if you're medically qualified. 
because it is so basic, the understanding that starch is sugar. And at that point, yeah, I thought I need to listen. And so I started asking questions. I was absolutely astonished to learn she was online, I think with 40,000 people on a website, diabetes.co. Diabetes.co.uk, yeah, still exists, right? It does, and they were teaching each other. And I, I really thought the, the physiological point she made was good. And when we did her blood pressure, she had achieved drug-free type 2 diabetes remission which I had never seen in 25 years of medicine. And this is 2012, it was, uh, in 2012. I'd never seen that. My All of my career was add a drug and another and another. And in fact, I had come to hate uh, diabetes as a subject because it was so miserable. And I, I remember I hived it. I was senior partner at the time. We had nine doctors and about nine or 10,000 patients. So as the boss, I just said, I'm not seeing people with diabetes anymore and made the junior partner do it. Anyway, the point- That's an interesting, but that's an interesting point that probably is going on in many doctors' heads today. It's yeah. frustrating. Yes, that's right. Well, you become a doctor hoping to make change and I wasn't. But what's wonderful now, Eric, is that those same patients are absolutely my favorite now because they're full of hope. And I, I just love a challenge. And I now, within the practice, I get all of the people with obesity and type 2 diabetes metabolic syndrome. And I absolutely love the work. And I am not retired. I'm still there 10 years on. And like you, I'm absolutely loving it because I'm seeing people properly well, not invented wellness but they're shining with health so that's the story one lady and then after so, that many others well i wonder this let's pause for a moment uh, let's say someone's watching they have a doctor who doesn't understand this they might even be against it um what did you learn i mean for me it was someone kind of flippantly saying well that that atkins book was written before you were born you know it was like it had to be some sort of but it wasn't it was close but you know, meaning it's been around so long. There had to be some kind of an emotional grab for me to be sucked into learning about it. Um, how how can a patient today influence their doctors? I think all over the world, this is a grassroots revolution, and some doctors are sufficiently curious. Uh, when they see success, they're interested in how it was done. My disappointment is that so many of our colleagues are not curious about success. Uh, but you can maybe induce curiosity by saying, dear doctor, just humor me. Let me, would you, all I ask is that we get by baseline data and that you let me have a blood test in a couple of months. Give me a chance to show what I can do with diet and lose weight. And I think you would be a very unreasonable doctor not to give your patient a chance to shine. And if your doctor won't even let you do that, I wonder whether that's, I wonder and wonder, and wonder whether that is the best doctor for you. Because it's not kind if you won't, well, unless the doctor can explain. Of course, it may be the doctor can say, well, it's certain death for whatever reason. Um, well, in my, I think, area, uh, in my area, the, um, Doctors who are most resistant have been sort of brainwashed in the plant-based. So it's like the only yes. thing they can say is you need to do plant-based. <laughs> You're like, wait a sec. So sometimes doctors think they have a better way to do it. But I love that where you just measure or, or come in with your data already, like your patient yeah. did. Yeah. And the other thing I'd say to people is between us, we've now written quite a few peer-reviewed papers and you could uh, collect your own data, but also there are now some very good papers that you can print off, open access papers you can print off and say, I see there's been quite a lot of interest in this internationally. And that may also help, possibly. You don't want to annoy a doctor, but uh, that, that, can, that can also help. So after that 
initial encounter, and it's similar. I had two patients lose weight on their own without me. They they didn't weren't quite so irritated <laughs> as your patient, but they it was that encounter and in, in my curiosity that led me into this. It wasn't my personal weight loss journey, mm -hmm. for example. But then what happened in your how did you gravitate in a GP practice and how is that different than it would be in the U.S.? I, I know yeah. whenever you come over here, well, you can talk about your surgery. And I remind you that, no, over yeah. here, it's a practice. So if you say surgery, oh, we do the think of it as a surgery, which is a ridiculously outmoded. So, yes, um, our our practice had had an eight-fold increase in the number of people with type. So I'm an NHS UK GP. And that means that patients are allocated to me. I don't choose my patients. That is the practice. And we, since I was a young man in 1986, because we audit our practice, we're computerized, so we know what's going on. By 2012, we'd had an eight-fold increase in the number of people with diabetes in my professional lifetime. And if that isn't a pandemic, an eight-fold, it's now gone to tenfold. So when I was a young man, diabetes was quite rare and it was older people. And it was obvious to me, it was worrying me that they were getting younger and younger, sicker and sicker. And so when this, I, I looked online and I saw that this lady of mine was not an isolated case. And around the world, there were many people. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting? Why don't I go on the diet myself? I had uh, moderate hypertension at the time, and I, I didn't know it, but I was actually diabetic. So I went on the diet, just as an experiment, to discover that my blood pressure improved, my mood improved, I needed an hour's less sleep. Then we had a problem. I, I, I believed in it, but my partners refused to let me do it. We had terrible arguments, because I said, I really believe in this, particularly for the younger diabetics. I'm, I'd like to do it. And they said, no. So Jen, my wife, my clever psychologist wife, who you've already interviewed, came up with a compromise, um, which I'm ashamed, really. So the first thing she said was, well, David, why aren't you doing this then? And, and I said, well, because we're not paid. And she said, that's funny. I, I thought I'd married a doctor. What is this paid business? She said, how many cars have we got? You know, are we, are we short of something? She said, you should do this for free. And um, she said, I'll work with you for free. Why don't we do this in an evening when the, when the building isn't being used? Why don't we do them in groups? Let's do them in, in uh, aliquots of 20 to 30. Let's do them in groups. And the nurse at the time was so excited by this, she said, I'll work for free as well. So then I said to the, the partners, let me do that. I'll do it for free. And if I can show results, can we discuss them at least in six months? And we did it for free. But after six months, I had astonishing results. I mean, really, I thought they were fraudulent. I was, I, I couldn't believe they were right. I kept checking the blood work. You must have had this, Eric, where the liver function improves in weeks. The triglycerides plummet, lipid profiles, blood pressure. I was deprescribing drugs. I'd never seen anything like it. So then I went with the data to the partners and actually what really happened was each one of them went low carb gradually. And partly another amusing thing is one of several of the partners were runners of which I am a runner, but in a sprint, I could beat them when I was low carb. And it's so annoying to have an old guy beat you at anything that that, that also caused them Low carb, the, the midwife lost four stone in weight. The practice manager went low carb. So we are now a low carb uh, practice with the majority of staff. They all know about low carb and we've, we've done TV, like you, we've done TV programs. It's the media in the UK are fascinated by it. So it's kind of taken off way more. I've just been astonished uh, and such cheerful medicine as well. It's really fun seeing people who are well. It's like being a magician. <laughs> yeah. Well, doctor, you know, the 
the doctor who takes out the appendix, the surgeon, that's you know, just what they do, right? Even though it's amazing I and mean, it's life saving and all that. And then, I mean, this, what's unusual is that most doctors, internists, GPs aren't reversing things like we can. So it is unusual, but it's, it's replicable and, and reliable and predictable, right? Yes. It, well, you uh, and I know when you see that same pattern in every surgery you do again and again, we, we now recognize all sorts of patterns. And that's why I'm so hopeful about this group of patients. Funnily enough, I was just doing the data on, um, on my practice now. And I've got fully a quarter of everybody with type 2 diabetes into drug-free remission. A quarter. And that's NHS medicine in the UK. And they're not self-selecting because I'm allocated patients. Mm -hmm. And it shows what's possible, at least. And it does. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work, but I have a quarter of everybody with diabetes. I'm assuming your environment is still very carb-heavy, like scones and... Oh, chips incredibly and in fact the more northern you are in the uk the more carbohydrate uh you tend to be so london people are slimmer there and as you go north in, in the uk people become heavier crescendoing in scotland uh but uh you know we're north of liverpool and so that's a constant battle but one of the advantages in, in UK general practice is the fact my patients, this continuity of care. So I've been there for 40 years, and, and although there are nine or 10,000 people, you'd be surprised how many people you get to know after 40 years. You know, I know grandma, I know auntie so-and-so, I know the family. And bless them, on the whole, they do trust me I, and that I'm, I'm doing my best. But many people, you must find this, they do well. And then you look again, and they've gained weight, and they're back to square one. And the challenge is that maintenance. I think that's that's yeah. the holy grail internationally. It's what is yeah. what are the best ways to help your patients maintain their improvement in this carby environment? And those are what interest me. Uh, what are the best maintaining factors to rescue people? Well, what uh, what have you well? in a practice, so to speak, that, so it's not, my practice is different. It's an obesity medicine practice where people come kind of knowing they want to focus on this. Uh, not everyone knows what I'm going to ask them to do. And I occasionally use medicines, but it's pretty much the diet. Do some of your patients kind of think this is a bait and switch that, you know, you're just the GP. Why are you talking about food? You know, um, so what patients do that? Well, I've got better, yes, yes. I've got better at that. I mean, one of the things is uh, I've got, again, it's the psychology around behavior change that's so fascinating. And the idea of working collaboratively with my patients so that I'm not telling them what to do, but I'm offering them choices. So one of the things is, you know, if I was starting metformin, I'd, I'd be, I'd be fair, I'd say to a patient, right, today, looking at your blood work, your blood's very sugary, I could do one of two things. I could offer you metformin, which has a 30% chance of diarrhea, um, and it would be the rest of your life, or I'd love to, you know, I believe I could make work just with diet. And if you say to patients, would you like lifelong drugs starting today? Or are you interested in, in maybe changing your lifestyle? And I could get your blood pressure down, get rid of your belly. You could feel better. Are you, you know, do you want to give me a chance? Because I'd love to do that. And I tell you, Eric, not one person in 12 years has turned me down. Well, when you put it, the juxtaposition position is nausea and diarrhea, lifelong. <laughs> or, but going out without my fruit, without my... Red. Yeah. It doesn't take long to get over well, that, does it? No. It's how you, if you start t saying, you, well, you need to give up your rice and bread, they say, I can't live without bread. I can't live without rice. But if I'm, if people are motivated and I've piqued their curiosity, then what they would otherwise object to, they don't. And they do try it in, I mean, they just do every clinic. 
Um, and, and we've got a PhD dietitian working with us looking at what my patients eat, and they really do cut back on the carbs, apart from all that old work and the weight loss. Of course, for those who, who don't know your work, um, you've not only worked with your own patients, you've created materials and worked with other programs. I really like your infographics about the amount of sugar in different foods and yes. how how do you use that in your teaching i'd love to well I'm, i was hoping you might ask about my my sugar infographics so in the early days it was a matter of in a 10 minute appointment i have to be so economical with time so how do i communicate 10, wait, 10 minutes that's it that's my lot 10 minutes when i trained you'll be astonished and hear i had five minute appointments 30 years ago, I ran on five-minute appointments. Anyway, wow. it's a luxury 10 now. So I've got to be quick. And uh, part of being quick is how do you illustrate to people the, the, the consequences of dietary choices? And I became interested in the, in the glycemic load. But explaining the glycemic load to people is time-consuming and confusing. And so I suddenly thought, well, why don't we illustrate the glycemic load of different foods in a way that my patients do understand? So I, I went and found one of the original guys, Dr. Jeffrey Leibsey, who was worked on the glycemic load. And I said to him, why can't we divide the glycemic load of various foods by the glycemic load of a teaspoon of sugar? And then, for instance, I can tell you uh, 150 grams of boiled rice, a small bowl of boiled rice, is exactly the same in blood sugar terms as 10 teaspoons of sugar. So whether you have a pile of boiled rice or 10 teaspoons of boiled sugar, the effect on your blood sugar is the same. And we did the calculations on eight or 900 foods and came up with the sugar infographics. And they've been downloaded. They're not uh, copyrighted. And if uh, I hope somebody here wants to see them, in which case all you do, Google PHC Unwin and the word sugar, and you will see them. And they're now in 37 languages. Wow. Uh, and have been loaded millions of times. And uh, as you were kind enough to say, people find them useful. And I hope more of you will steal them, take them. There's no copyright. I make no money out of any of this. Just steal it. And um, it's to help people understand the consequences of, of what you eat in terms of blood sugar. And PHC stands, stands for Public Health Collaboration. Yeah, it's a charity. So I, I'm fascinated not by how I make progress in my practice, but how do we make progress both nationally and internationally? Well, so it became obvious. So for those who don't know you, you're the humblest world leader that there you know ever has been uh, in the medical world anyway so yeah um the but how are, are you um tell me the other organizations you've been involved in i, I were you part of diabetes well, oh, yeah okay well well one of the funniest things was diabetes.co.uk so i went to this is the organization that had 40 and very good low carb um, uh, site on their on their website there, and I went on there to see all these people, and I was so sorry, really, for, uh, sorry about my colleagues, all the critical comments that patients were suffering, all of this shroud waving of, you know, you'll die if you go low carb, and uh, all of this, and I was so sorry. I went online uh, to say I'd quite like to help you as an organisation, and to my astonishment. The answer to that was to be suspended as a troll instantly because they didn't trust any doctor, to be fair. I didn't even know what a troll was. I I'd know I had to ask my kids, what is a troll? And they laughed and laughed. And not only did they suspend me, they had me investigated and they sent the owners of the website up to Liverpool to see if I was a fraud. And then we were good friends. By the end of half an hour, we were good friends. And that was how... Uh, they could tell I was sincere, and that was how the low carb program was born. There was that which I had them design, and that's Arjun and 
with yes, the Arjun Shal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in Charlotte. Yeah, it was the low car program and they'd just written this low car program, but they hadn't got a single doctor who was prepared to help them. And I said, Well, you know, medically you could probably do with a doctor and they gave me a few weeks. They said, Well, we want to get it out there. You can look you can say what you like for say two to three weeks. And now actually four hundred and sixty thousand people have done that program and we've published results. So that was one diabetes.co.uk. I then began to think about the media. Um, and one of the, if you, so the media love before and after photos. They just love it. And it, I thought, well, let's supply the media with what they love. So I would say to patients, right, take a photo of yourself today at your fattest. And if I, if, if what I do works, would you be prepared to share the fattest photo and your thinnest photo. And if I fail, you owe me nothing, nothing. And because of that, I've got a whole series of really spectacular before and afters. And the papers love it. I, I think I've written 36 articles for our most popular paper, the Daily Mail. But there isn't a paper I haven't contributed to now in the UK. And so I started thinking, well, what is it the papers want before and afters? They like patient stories. And because of the groups, I got a whole load of expert patients, really, who said, I want to thank you, Dr. Unwin. What can I do? And I'd say, would you talk to the media for me? And they do. Uh, and that's, so that was another thing, the, the media. That also led to Twitter. I, I think Twitter's great for this is where the grassroots revolution is at on Twitter. I'm at low carb GP. And that's been very successful, very powerful. And then I'd set my sights on my Royal College. And I thought, well, how can we, how can the Royal College of General Practitioners, how might they get involved? And Arjun and Charlotte of diabetes.co.uk, so I never accept cash for things because I, I like to remain independent. But they kind of owed me because I'd done a lot, really a lot for them. So I said, would you fund an educational e-learning module to be given to every GP in the UK for free? And they did. So I went to the Royal College, said, I've got a backer. Can we produce this e-learning module? Um, and it then can be free to, there are 52,000 GPs in the UK. And that turned out to be the most successful e-learning module the college has ever done on low carb. So that re and that the badging with the college was good. And then they made me a, what am I now? I'm a clinical expert. That's right. I'm a Royal College clinical expert in diabetes. That kind of came on with, uh, with that. So now we had the college and we were starting to work with the Daily Mail and then another problem I had was enemies. I don't know. Have you got enemies, Eric? People who say you're rubbish and dangerous. Not to my face. <laughs> ah. No, not to you. Well, I actually had enemies who would shout at me in public. Uh, when I began, I could be heckled as a speaker. And I was shouted at and told that what I did was dangerous. And I should be ashamed. I got hate mail and all sorts. Particularly, I have to say, from dietitians. I don't know. I was mystified. But they did me a favor. I see now they did me a favor because I was so scared of what could happen. And, and then I thought, well, I do need to be very careful. And I started collecting really careful baseline data and latest follow-up for all of my patients. Because I, I think we, we stand or fall on our data. And I know the average weight loss. I know what happens to blood pressure. I know what, all of these things after 12 years. And that baseline and latest follow-up data was the beginning of starting to publish peer-reviewed papers, which on the whole GPs do not do. And, and some of the papers have been very, very successful. And the, the, we're trying to change now the the whole environment of papers where what clinicians notice is important and, and what are auditing our clinics is important. 
So those are all the various ways. I'm busy on many fronts. You know, years ago, I did randomized trials with funding, small amounts <laughs> of funding, and then set up a clinic based on the research that we and others had done. Then the computer system in the U.S. started to change, and they all the academic programs all kind of got into this big monster program that's very difficult to extract information from. In fact, you have to pay someone else to do it. So I, you know, I, at first I set up a clinic and we put all of our hand entered our own information into Microsoft Access, which is, you know, one of these old things and then things happen. And now, you know, I'm just, I'm quite jealous, actually. I would love to have the ability to do the, the an audit or a clinical review of our patients. Yeah. <laughs> What's happened for my clinic now is that fellows, so trainees in different areas will come and review under certain content areas. So like for renal mm-hmm. failure, people looked at the charts. Uh, <laughs> you have one too, which uh, t- um, kind of debunking the old myth that yes. high protein diets protein. cause renal fa- failure or, or kidney problems. Well, this isn't high protein and it, it doesn't, but now uh, we have someone looking at heart failure patients because the the medication world using a drug that causes ketosis thinks now that ketosis might be the reason why the drug prevents recurrent heart attacks. That's the Jardian, Sinvocon, <laughs> SGL. So it's like coming back where it's, well, hey, why don't we just put people on it? keto diet. And I have several anecdotes of people reversing their heart failure on the keto Me diet. Too. So getting into this um, through diabetes, have there been any other clinical, since you have all sorts of different uh, diseases? Loads. What yeah. you learn? Loads. I don't know where. Loads. So we're a bit like you. So first of all, it was uh, liver function, fatty liver. I'd really emphasize fatty liver is reversed rapidly. And um, so that's the first thing. Then blood pressure. Um, Evan, and, has it occurred to you? Has it ever occurred to you that essential hyper- hypertension, which means we don't know the cause, is from yeah. carbs? Yes, I've written a paper on it. Eric, you must read my paper. So what I did. No, was, you know, was, too many. Too many. Yeah. Oh. Yes, let me tell you about this. So I found, I was so curious about all of these blood pressures improving that I was de-prescribing 20% of all the drugs for blood pressure. So what I was, what really intrigued me were these various factors. I noticed the patients needed more salt. I noticed that they got a diuresis when they went low carb. That means they wee more, curing some people's heart failure. And the blood pressure dropped, even though they're having more salt. So it was really odd. And so I dis- I found a, a professor of cardiology, Professor Brady of Glasgow University. And um, I said, would you look at all my data and can we do a paper together? And we went back and discovered that we've known since 1932 that insulin causes renal sodium retention. So that a high carb diet is a high insulin diet and you're retaining salt. When you go low carb, you wee out that salt, the blood pressure drops and blood pressure tends to normalize. And I went to the partners and said, essential hypertension. I wonder why, isn't that odd that we call this, do we not know what it's caused by? And they said, don't be silly, David. It's called essential because we'll never know. And I said, I don't really buy into never knowing and that I just, again, curious. And so that was blood pressure. So you could maybe look at my paper on that one. It's a very successful paper, Professor Brady. And then the next one was renal function. It was my wife. I, I got heckled by a dietitian, And she said, aren't you, why aren't you worried about all that protein and the renal function? At that point, I, I didn't know. But you see, I'd got the data. So all I had to do was I've got that data set. So I just went into what happens to renal function. And to my astonishment, it improved significantly. I'd missed it because the improvements were small, but ubiquitous. So it was right across the board. 
and I didn't see it because they just improved a little bit. But the EGFR and creatinine improved, and I wrote that up with Professor Wong, another professor of nephrology, who, and then they looked into the whole history of this uh, protein and renal failure. There's a paper by Brenner, shocking paper, and when I went, I actually bought the paper, when I went behind the paywall, there is no human data in that paper. It was vampire bats, it was guinea pigs, and there was no human data. It had been cited hundreds and hundreds of times and was wrong. And so that was really interesting. So protein, I don't worry about that now, uh, unless they're really severely uh, renal impairment. But even then, as you know, uh, with Professor Weems and various other nephrologists around the world looking at keto, there is some early signs that even polycystic kidney disease may respond. That's fascinating, yeah. It's, in, it's then, almost... Go on. I was going to say, it's almost like the what people heckle you about are the things that actually improve. But yeah. but if everyone thinks it's bad, they can't accept that it's good. So yeah. it's like people, psychology has to go through, well, no, it's not bad, wait a few years, and then, oh, no, actually it's good. But if you come in and say, no, it's not only not bad, it's good for you, it, it doesn't sink in. No, it, it, and that's why I ended up writing all these papers, because my partners were getting scared. But it's, it's a weird thing. If you write a peer-reviewed paper, then apparently it's true, suddenly. Well, <laughs> I had that, had that experience. So uh, I, you know, I, I years ago went to visit. I had the luxury to visit a doctor who was doing it. That was Dr. Atkins. That was about 1998, yeah. And 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 so I got to see a clinic that it was seeing people, you know, and seeing changes already occurring. Um, and he said certain things, but nobody believed it. Then in 2005, Gunter Bowden was a, a researcher, said the exact same thing. In fact, he kind of looked like Dr. Atkins. He was this older yeah. guy, white hair, and he was on TV being interviewed. Yes, low carb diets reverse diabetes in our study. And then everyone believed it, even though it was the same words coming in. But, you know, that's the the importance of clinical research, that, and especially now with the Internet. I mean, who, who do you believe? And it, it, for, for my listeners, I always say consider the source. And trust, I think, uh, comes from those who are in a practice actually doing it uh, and uh that's that's fantastic so other um heartburn of course yeah go on pretty quickly skin psychiatry certainly anxiety uh or sleep um psoriasis sometimes eczema commonly irritable bowel syndrome now uh, very often you'll find it's bread or uh, something like that so i'm beginning mm -hmm. what next you know what next well, so it was 15 years from our proof of, proof of concept study on IBS diarrhea, IB, IBS diarrhea predominant, with just this last few months, the randomized trial of three groups showing low carb is better than low FODMAP and the drug for IBS. Yes. So it took 15 years. Yes. So often it, the, uh, the research is lagging. That's that grassroots thing. Yeah, it is. One one little hint I've got. I, one of the things is I try not to annoy people too much. Um, and You're smoother than I am. But well, I try not to annoy because it, you know, it doesn't help much. And one thing that's less controversial is instead of talking low carb, I'm beginning to say, why don't you just eat nutritionally dense food that doesn't put your blood sugar up? Because how can that be a controversial statement for people with diabetes? Why don't you just eat nutrient-dense food that doesn't spike your blood sugar? And well, you know what I ask? Go. When I ask yeah. people, when I ask the youngsters, trainees come in, and I say, what is diabetes? They'll, and patients even are now coached, well, it's a relative, my, I don't have enough insulin to, and I said, no, 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 you're measuring the blood sugar. It's too much sugar. And so we, it used to be called sugar diabetes. Yes, it was. Yeah, I wish it was called that. Uh, Me too. But, but the, I just going back to the, um, this is fascinating because we're talking about lots of things, but the, the comfort level of using it, 
I got to see another doctor who had been using it for 30 years. And then Arjun uh, Panasar and the diabetes.co.uk and your, your group started to do it online. And I, I, was, I was afraid of that, right? I didn't want to lower the blood glucose and cause harm. But now decades of diabetes.co.uk being safe use, teaching people, we finally have our own course that we're yeah. just launching uh, this spring to help people understand diabetes. And, but I, so I'm kind of a, some people think that, you know, we're, we're new or, or um, early adopters when no, actually this has been around a long time in oh, my world. Yes. We validated, put things into the, the literature and now you're taking the baton and studying and, and publishing based on the audit of your practice, which is so great. Yeah, well, it's so. kind of necessary. The other thing is I like I like to get back to sugar, talking about sugar. So right from the beginning, hemoglobin A1C is the average sugariness of your blood. Where do you think that sugar's come from? So from in my 10 minutes, we're talking sugar. You've come about your hemoglobin A1C result, right? Well, that's the average sugariness of your blood. You're very sugary. I'm wondering where that's come from. So within seconds, we're into discussing sugar. And that's where I stay. And every, every clinic, I'm sure you and I, with, we're, we're searching for the sugar. Yeah. And then... There aren't we in every uh, consultation. Where is the sugar in the old diet? And well, how much sugar is in the bloodstream? Yes, not much. But, you know, I, I've had the... It's a teaspoon. It's a teaspoon. A teaspoon of sugar. So it's yeah. the infographic's perfect with the it, yeah one yeah, It's sugar. about one. We done the calculus. It's about one teaspoon. So if you think that a banana, going back to my teaspoons of sugar equivalent, a banana is equivalent depending on its ripeness, uh, maybe five or six teaspoons of sugar. Well, that's easily enough because if you've only got one teaspoon of sugar in the whole bloodstream, banana is more than enough to double your blood sugar, maybe treble it. I've had professors, professors of endocrinology come up to me saying, well, I never thought of it that way. Of it, never thinking about the, the actual the challenge that we're facing is the five grams of glucose in the blood being just, you know, maybe seven and a half grams, a very small elevation. And then you get toes amputated, you get, you get blindness and heart failure or heart attacks. And, yes. and so the fact that, um, some organizations, diabetes organizations actually push more carbs into the diet, it does kind of lend me either, either the, the context was totally lost, the professors and advisors just didn't under, didn't ever do the middle school, you know, primary yeah. education math, to, or or they're in cahoots with the companies that you know you since the blood sugar is up and we you know if you have a low blood sugar, to me it means you have too much medication. To them, it just pushed carbs. You'll never have a low blood sugar. I got actually one time face to face. I did get to loggerheads now that I think about it with a diabetes educator who was fantastic and loved her patients. And she said, you can't tell people to stop the carbs and the food. I said, yes, I do. And, and she, well, I, then I, it occurred to me, I reduced the insulin at the same time. Well, because she couldn't. So she was faced with doctors pushing drugs that caused the low blood sugar. And she was saving lives by telling people to eat carbs because she wasn't in control of the medication. Yeah. That was like an aha moment to me. Well, that but, we do is we take control of both. Yeah. Well, I think the thing is what we are beginning to think about the true causes of chronic disease. And and I suddenly realized I was a fraud as a you know, thinking I'm a scientist as a doctor. We weren't. We never thought about the actual causes. You know, diabetes is not a failure of your metformin gland, like a mysterious failure and metformin replacement will cure it. Diabetes, we've eaten our way, most of us, including me as somebody with type 2 diabetes, I have eaten my way into type 2 diabetes. I worked on that for about 30 years, biscuits and, and so on. And then 
on top of that is the true causes of essential hypertension and the true causes of fatty liver. And that's what I really find very so, interesting. Now. Are you ready? Or wait, maybe you've already written the paper and I haven't read it. Ready to collaborate on a paper that says, you know, our current medical system really hasn't fixed anything and it's because nobody talks about food, you know, the root cause. Well, oh gosh, now I'm getting to, now I'm getting all excited. Well, the, what I say in my practice and in front yeah. of other doctors, that I, I practice the best internal medicine of my life. Me too. But I mean, food, not, not yeah, drug. Me too. Yeah. So For me, maybe, it, 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 it's a luxury at the end of my career. I will not compromise now. I will yeah. not do poor oh, medicine. Yeah. You can't force me. You can't frighten me. You can't, you know, threaten me because it's the end of my career and I, I'm loving doing it properly. It's such a luxury. And uh, switching gears, but you might just be able to spend more time on your farm. Tell me about that. Oh, I love, well, yes. So in, in my spare time, I, I manage 40 acres of bird reserves and a farm. So we, we, I have about four or five separate bird reserves and we manage those in part with regenerative agriculture. So producing mutton, but at the same time, we're optimizing. Okay, now I, I'm sorry. I, I need a translation. What's a bird, a bird reserve? A bird reserve is where what, what wild birds, British wild birds, who are all in decline, but they, they, these areas of, of wild land where wild birds can prosper. Oh, like protect and, and in, Yes, yes, I did say. So I'm, I'm the senior trustee of the Three Owls Bird Sanctuary, which is another charity that I do. And people leave us money. And I go and buy land and I take it out of wheat production or whatever. And then we start producing meat, but we do it in a way that generates insects and flowers and all. And then, and then mutton, mutton for the rest of us. Mutton is, I can't bring myself to kill a lamb, you know, the lamb, uh, yeah. I just can't. And I discovered that if you let them grow to like really big say to two years, it's even tastier and they've had much a better life. So we, and uh, mutton, actually worldwide, people ate mutton a hundred years ago. Nobody ate lamb. Uh, and that's old sheep to you. Old sheep. <laughs> okay. Old sheep. Well, Partly, it's not available in the States, I don't think. It's a sort of connoisseur's item. It's so tasty. But I just think so it's the... fair sheep. And explain the regenerative agriculture a little yeah. bit. There's a, a lot of fear of, of the agri... Yeah. Yeah. So what the, the idea is, um, if, you, if you look after the soil properly, um, you then have more insects. You have grass with a better uh, micronutrient profile. And... Actually, grazing animals are a good part of that because they produce poo. So they're recycling grass into poo. And then the poo, as long as you don't use insecticides, then the poo uh, is great for insects and the birds eat the insects. And then we produce a hay crop, which is wildflowers. So what do birds eat? Seeds. And they're in the wildflowers. And what do insects like? Nectar, they're in the wildflowers. So that, I'll give you an example. One of my reserves originally grew leeks and only leeks. It was a monoculture of leeks and had been for years. On that patch of land, nothing nested, nothing moved, nothing lived. It was sprayed with insecticide four times a year and herbicide three times a year. On the same plot of land now, exactly the same plot of land after five years, I've got 23 species of nesting bird. Not 23 nesting birds, 23 species of bird living on there and it's producing mutton, and we've got four species of bat and 135 species of moth. And it was a monoculture. It was dead. And most, when I fly over America, most of America is dead. Factory farming, so true and tragic what's happening to our soil. It'll all blow away. A lot of it has done, of course. But regenerative farming gives hope. Because I don't think, you know, just for me, you you and I, we, we, 
we have to think about the food supply and is it sustainable? And, uh, you know, I'm a great believer in eating meat, but you have to show some interest where that meat came from and are we destroying the environment? And so I decided to climb on board of that as well and experiment. Well, can we produce meat without destroying the environment? And the answer is definitely, because I've done it. Uh, so there we are. That's a little... You could look me up on the Three Owls Bird Sanctuary. We've got a website and you can see the birds. and all The, the Three Owls Bird Sanctuary, there you go. That's uh, fantastic. And, you know, it's important to bring that up just for for um, people watching that, that, that uh, generally... Um, there's, most doctors have outside interests and creativity and all that, but I've noticed among low car people touched by the low carb diet in some way, they end up having more interests that are, you know, like becoming farmers and worried yes. about uh, the quality of the food. And, and so it becomes part of a, a mission even, and we've been criticized for being yeah. cult or mission. Like, no, it, it, we're zealots. Apparently I think that's the word. Well, yeah, well, but it's about health, right? And well, it's so you know, I feel like I could talk for another hour, and I do want to have you back at some point. Good, uh, keep talking, Come. and perhaps think about this. Uh, um, we practice the best medicine without medicine, perhaps, or some. You know, that food is really, and you know, I see this food as medicine thing, but you know, it was Rob Lustig who said, well, good food is medicine. Bad food requires medicine, which is a little interesting twist, but you yes. to give other doctors an out. Well, of course you can use those drugs because those people aren't eating well. But uh, well, so now are, have, uh, kind of ending up, are you, um, so you're hopeful. Uh, are, uh, uh, what would be the most important things you think we can do to make change? That's a really good question. I think some of it is happening. I think the continuous glucose monitors are beginning to help us because that brings us back to talking sugar. And you know, Jen would explain to you that feedback is more effective the more immediately it comes on the behavior. And so I'm using uh, continuous glucose monitors and type 2 diabetes against the British guidelines a lot. And as they get cheaper... I think they're the cavalry coming over the hill for you and I because nobody, if you've got a continuous glucose monitor and you have a bowl of cornflakes, you're in for a shock because it will spike. And uh, this is what I'm talking about, this let's be curious about where the sugar is in your diet. And if you are curious for the, you know, for the sake of a few dollars. So I'm now thinking, shouldn't people who are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in the UK, I would have them given a free a month on a continuous glucose monitor because you'd learn so much. And I know the hope for me is when we when we did the data on who do you get the best results on, I know that if you come to me with diabetes in the first year, 73% will achieve drug-free type 2 diabetes remission in the first year. So if, if we used glucose monitors in the first year routinely, I think that could make such a difference. And when you look at the cost of the drugs at a, at a nationwide basis, that's a money saver. And I, I actually, my final point is about insurance companies. Somebody has to pay for all these drugs. And I don't know of a single country that can afford them. And the SGL2 inhibitors will create a, a, a real problem for you in the States because of the expense. And who's paying for them? And that, that's why I'm so excited. I've been working with the second largest reinsurance company in the world. Swiss Re have been working with me now for six years. They're really interested and other insurance companies are interested. And I think the combination of continuous glucose monitoring and backing and support from people who maybe have nearly the same power as the drug companies, as the insurance companies, we have to move quickly because the drug companies will start buying the insurance companies if we're not careful in order to yeah. stop this yeah. happening. But th those are the, the kind of things. And then we get back through glucose monitoring into sugar. Where does it come from? And I think the other thing is is what we, the, this holy grail of maintenance, that we could chat about that another time. 
you know, in our clinics, I'd be, I'd love to talk to you about what is effective. What do you, because each of us is learning how to protect our patients, how to care for them and how to rescue them when they go off, uh, off piste. Let's do that. Love it. How can people find you or what, what's, uh, the things you'd like to people know? Yeah. About? Well, mainly, uh, low carb GP, please, uh, follow me on Twitter, low carb GP, or you can, uh, the public health collaboration is the charity we help set up. And in there are all of the diet sheets, uh, the protocols. We've we've listed all the RCTs, so there's loads of evidence for you, and it's all free, and it's a British charity, so none of us make any money out of it. That'll do. Thank you so much. Keep doing what you're doing, and hope to see you soon at a meeting. Definitely. I, I knew I'd enjoy speaking to you, and then I did. Thank you so much. Goodbye. I know. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and check out adapterlifeacademy.com.